This is the Commercial Landscaper Podcast hosted by Dave Anderson and Robert Klinkebeard. This show will transform your leadership by developing all aspects of your life in business, family, personal and health. Only by fine-tuning yourself will you truly operate as a highly functioning leader. Hi everyone, this is uh, Robert Klinkenbeard and Dave Anderson from the Commercial Landscapers Podcast. Happy to welcome Greg Crabtree on the call today. Greg is going to just talk about himself, his business. He's an expert in financials, trying to help your company. He certainly helped my company out a lot. And he was involved in the Scaling Up book with Vern Harness show. Without further ado, Greg, welcome. Tell us, give us a 30 second pitch about yourself and your background. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I appreciate uh, having that. Basically, uh, started my life as a frustrated accountant that realized I hated accounting. So uh, <laughs> when I joined the Entrepreneurs Organization in 2001 and got really hyped up with just focusing my practice around the needs of entrepreneurs, totally changed my focus. And, and so really started to dig in and create ways to help entrepreneurs grow and scale their business and create the wealth they deserve out of it. That led to... Uh, serving some in some leadership capacities. I served on the EO Global Board for three years, got off of that, then had time to put into writing my first book. Uh, and within about a month, uh, we should have finally the second book, which I think is really going to set the, uh, the financial world on fire with some, some really good insights that I think we've uncovered in the last 10 years that we've been applying these techniques to our clients. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, every time I bring up your name or your book, Greg, I mean, I just get so many people, their eyes light up and some of the, the value that you bring from that. So that, that leads me into my first question. If we've got a handful of um, entrepreneurs that are just early on in their business, uh, what would be the, probably the thing they need to think about most as they're starting to you know, understand their financials, trying to figure out how to pay themselves? What, 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 what would be the biggest piece of advice from an up-and-coming business? Yeah, really, you know, I, I start the next book with what kind of distilled down into three simple rules of business success. Uh, first rule is figure out what the market needs. Don't sell them what you do. Figure out what they need. And need isn't necessarily just product or service. It's how you interface with a customer, you know, and what, what, what are their preferences and those things. And once I figure out that need, then I go to can I do it profitably? And so I, I like the Warren Buffett, you know, for rule of rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And, and so we're, even though you can run a business at times at a loss, you better have big buckets of money to support that. And so, you know, but the crowning piece that I think we've learned in the last 10 years is the, the missing piece of the puzzle, which the third rule is of the profit that you generate, can it produce at a rate a 50% return on invested capital or higher? We've kind of established that as now in the first book, I kind of had some observational levels of profit, 10 to 15 percent, something like that. But that didn't work for every business because of the capital input varies from business model. And so now we have developed the, uh, a process that we set capital or set profit targets now based on return on invested capital targets. Uh, and it's it's really proven to be a spot on way of looking at best in class in each industry. Cool. David? Yeah. So I'm a new business owner. I've been in a year, been in business a year, two years, three years, starting to get some traction. I'm working every day in the business and sometimes finances take the back seat. What kind of what, what kind of best practices, what do I use when it's time to bring somebody in house to really bring financial focus to my organization that's really, you know, spending their time looking at it. In a lot of ways, people consider that just an overhead cost, but how should, you know, owners look at that when, when it's an investment, not just the payroll cost? Well, the nice thing is, is you've seen a disruption in the accounting support structure of businesses. And so with uh, shrinking accounting departments with the advent of technology, the first thing I would focus on is just making sure that my operational systems are fully deployed and I've got people out in the field that are doing the brunt of data tagging, data touching. And this is very prevalent in the landscape industry of guys in the field with an iPad that are doing quotes or doing final billings on projects at client site. And so most of our landscape clients are able to actually, as we say, bill quickly and bill often. 
you know, in that process, but you're, you're diminishing the role of the back office bookkeeper. And so I, in many of my talks, I talk about there's four things that you need from a financial person. I need a CFO, somebody for strategic finance, an hour, a quarter, maybe at best. You, you got to go a long way before you really need a CFO. Secondly, I need a controller about one day a month. Of all the data that's in there, let's validate it and just make sure that it's right. I need a good accounting manager one day a week to do some of the higher, you know, coordination functions of cash management, bill payment, you know, weekly reporting, some of those things. And I generally need a bookkeeper, you know, maybe one day a week. And so the idea is none of those skill sets require a full-time person. And the problem that you run into is, I, you know, you can never work up rate. You can only work down rate. And so the mistake that everybody makes is they overhire and that person, I will tell you, in the world of accounting, the higher level you are, the worse you are at the lower level tasks because you shortchange them, you cut corners. Oh, I got that. I got that. And, and so what we really like to see is, is understand each functional area and buy those on a, on a needed basis. And so the idea is, you know, what, what are the basic needs of the business and what can be outsourced? What can, when, when do I need a person internally? I mean, when our team supports a client of ours in that process, we may start off doing some of those closing procedures and some of those things that an accounting manager or controller may do. But as soon as the cost to us is equal to what they can hire a full-time person, we're pushing them saying, listen, it, you're, you're ready. You know, go hire your own internal person and we'll back you up and we'll always be your, your backstop, but it, it's time to make that transition. The, the challenge is, is it's a little bit of a, a, a challenge to find those credible providers uh, out there, but we've, we've got a few sources. We, we do only a limited amount of, of full outsource bookkeeping. We generally try to stay to the month end closing you know, control procedures when we deploy that piece of our practice and that team. But we found some good full back back office bookkeeping companies that, that have had good results. And part of it is, is you sometimes have to adapt to their ways. Probably the best ones, I will say, they're going to make you some, they're going to keep you in a very narrow lane in terms of either their platform uh, of accounting uh, system that they want you to run off of or rhythm of process. Uh, but But at the end of the day, it's more so about getting piecing together those resources as you scale. And then as you get bigger, you can bring your own team in internally. And there's a, there's a proper time to do that. And any credible practitioner will, will be open of saying, listen, you, you're, it's time for you to bring this in-house and don't be afraid of it. It'll, it'll work for you. Don't overpay for it. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Makes sense. I, I always remembered, Greg, that one of the most enlightening conversations that, I can't remember if it was you or one of your team, you did a, a Zoom call to your company and you explain to the team just about the cost of growth and, and, and minimum net profit levels. And, you know, I think we were operating, you know, pretty low, probably three, 4%. But of course, all their, our employees thought we were making so much money because they were just looking at the top line revenue. Right. But yeah, what, what would you say, how, how do you, I suppose, try and educate some of your the team, you know, middle management, um, even some of the senior management on some of that cost of growth and what type of profit levels you should be looking at and what, how would you, what would your advice be? Well, I think what everybody fails to understand is there's a difference between profitability and cash flow. And so this is a key topic that I do a lot more discussion on in the next book. Is, is really this idea around understanding every business model is a little bit different. So like in the landscaping uh, industry, depends on whether or not, are you somebody who builds upon service where you're carrying no AR? Are you somebody that carries inventory because you're supporting a lot of uh, projects and you're, you're, you're carrying, you know, uh, common supplies and everything, and, but you're billing, you know, customers uh, and giving them terms. Uh, and then how much support do you get from your vendors and, and those things? And so we've developed this idea of understanding kind of the capital signature of a business, mostly between not this idea of working capital, but a term we call trade capital, which think of working capital excluding cash and debt because those are choices. Think of those things that work off of each other, AR, inventory, work in progress, minus AP, minus deferred revenue where I can bill in advance to a customer. and and so once you understand the, those features, 
then you can start to play into the fact that the cost of growth is two things. You know, what did I have to spend to go get the customer? That's that's a marketing cost. What did I have to spend in cash flow to go start that customer on a turnover cycle before I actually get to collect any of that cash? And so that gets into these return on invested capital concepts that, that we discovered that really kind of we can give every business model its own formula. And then kind of like once they see it, you can then start to say, well, can I challenge this? Can I get more profit and make this a positive cash flow generating business and overcome the capital requirements? Or do I have to find a way to lower the capital? Or can I do a little bit of both and meet them in the middle? And so we, we came up with this concept, we call it this CPR, uh, cash power ratio. So if you look at profit as a percent to revenue compared to trade capital as a percentage of revenue, that tells you whether or not any growth is going to be cash flow generating or cash flow consuming. And, I, you know, it's, this is just a classic example of human behavior. Once they see it, it's amazing how they respond to it. I mean, it's like people that told you, I can't get more profit. I can't get, well, all of a sudden they find a way to get more profit. I can't do anything about terms. All of a sudden they find different ways of working with customers and, and vendors and, and optimizing because it, it's, the, the way that we've taught cash flow in the past has been too singularly focused on managing AR, managing AP, managing inventory. It's not – all those are okay, but it's the net of how those things fit together because if I press on one, something squirts out over here. And the key is i got to create a containment of all of those things as they work together – and then I got to monitor it. I've got to have a way to see it move across time. And traditional financial presentation does not allow you to see that in the way that you need to, to know when is it drifting. Mm, very interesting. Very, very interesting. There's so many different ways to look at um, how we do our uh, financial management, cash flow, and all of that, that that go with it. You know, kind of keying off of what Robert was just talking about, are you an advocate of open book accounting within the organization? Um, where Where do you draw the line on what you tell and don't tell? Because I'm exact same as Robert, you know, they see our top line numbers and they think that I'm rolling in cash. So how, how do you help overcome that? Yeah, I, I, I am a huge fan of open book. I, I attended, I got a chance to do the Springfield remanufacturing plant tour back in the late nineties, attended their great game gathering uh, several times and then actually spoke at their conference a year, about a year ago. I, I, I'm a huge fan of open book management. Open book management has a range of concepts of how it's, it is deployed. What our philosophy is, is we think it's okay to share data down to what we call contribution margin, which what most people call gross profit. Revenue minus direct cost is gross margin. Gross margin minus direct labor is contribution margin. And those are unloaded, pure, what we call the contribution margins of the output of the business engine. Everything else is structural. Everything is supporting you know, what we call operating expenses. Other people may call overhead or GNA. And, and so if you just focus people's attention to contribution margin performance, because that's where 99% of your team has an ability to make something happen. They don't get to make choices on the facilities you rent. They don't get to make choices on whether or not you have coffee in the break room. Uh, they, they can make suggestions and claim, but you get to make the final decision. They don't get to make decisions on management salaries and payroll taxes and those things. And so the idea is I, I have a very strong belief that only hold people accountable to the, the, the net output of the number that they can influence. And, and so we've not seen a case where you can't share down to contribution margin. The challenge with sharing all the way down to profitability is, you know, certainly key executives, I think that's a, certainly an appropriate thing. Whether or not you share it for the business in total that's going to be on an individual preference basis. So my my rule of thumb is, is always you have to have two conditions present to do open data sharing. Number one is there can't be any protected species on payroll. So that's your that's your big problem. You got to be playing business straight up. I can't be playing any games and running personal stuff or or running people through the payroll that don't really earn it. 
even if I'm not disclosing salary data, because people will put in, the, they, they associate a cost to a person they know is not necessary. And then secondly, the owner's got to be able to defend the data. If the own, I can coach them up, I can give them all the talking points, I can even talk to the team. But if that owner can't defend that data when I'm not present, don't do it because you will only hurt yourself and shoot yourself in the foot. But otherwise, I mean, we generally, I, I would say, I'd probably say 80% or more of our clients share openly down to contribution margin. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that as well. I think we, we had a big changing moment in our company when we did open book management and it definitely got more people engaged in uh, making the right decisions. Um, well, and, and in your case, Robert, I will say this too, is the fact that you had segment reporting and ability to look at LER by different segment and you could kind of look at best in class and challenge the other segments to say, why aren't you doing this if these guys are doing this? Wow, that was that was good. Yeah, it was huge. Monitoring that LER at the different different segments was yeah super helpful for us. Now one thing you touched upon and we'll we'll make this the, the final question, but you know you touched on labor and just how it's the effects of that on now different businesses, whether it be landscape companies or any other, I suppose service type companies. And what what type of efforts are you seeing to try and contain that labor cost or, or pivots for companies are making? Because, you know, obviously a lot of states are now moving towards the minimum wage. There's demand mm-hmm. in labor. Uh, what, what are you seeing out there? And, you know, out of that, think about, you know, what type of nuggets would a company listening to this come away with? Well, you know, and this may strike people as strange, but it's not about containing cost. It is about getting value for the cost spent. I, you know, we, we've got a client that does an incredible job with a lawn care business, uses some H2B visa uh, labor. And it kind of kind of gets me when people say that that's cheap labor. It's like, it, it ain't cheap. I mean, it, I mean he's paying a good price. And he can get people that are non-H2B workers to work for that same labor rate. They just don't produce. I mean, literally, it's almost double the output of that visa worker to the non-visa worker, which, you know, I, it, it, that's the part that people don't get about this labor discussion. I don't care where you get the labor from. It is for every dollar of labor input, what is the output? And that's the power of the LER concept. It's not about head counts, not about bodies. It is about a dollar of labor input to a multiplier of dollar labor, labor output that gives you that, that level playing field of what's good and what's not. Now, what I will tell you is, as we see, because our practice is all over the U.S., where people are pushing up the labor rate uh, artificially, locally, generally the market does reprice. And, and so you're either going to find, and we've seen this with some of our landscaping clients, some of them choose to exit a segment of service. And, and i give you a good example. We, we have a client who's excellent at lawn care and a, and a client, that, and that's all they focus on. And we we had a mastermind group with another landscaping company in it, in it with them, and the other client who does full range of landscaping chose to get out of the lawn care business, even though he knew the other guy's approach to it, because he said, "I can never manage it to the way you're doing it." But here's my alternative. He found a way to be the seller of it and collect his margin for being the facing to the customer, and then he basically just you know contracted out to a, he had a three or four key contractors that he subbed it out to and they agreed to meet the minimum quality standards and all those things. So there's, there's multiple plays you can run. And at the end of the day, he actually made a better margin by choosing to manage it that way. Now it's not, it's not, you know, without effort, he has to have, he has to be a subcontractor manager and there's a value for that. But if you, if you're not going to be the best in class, then don't try to be what the other guy was doing, right, which he's right. one of the best operators I've ever seen. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I can I can understand that. I can relate to that issue that uh, they were mm-hmm. facing, but uh, it's good that yeah. they're, they went a different direction and got a positive result. Yeah, and both of them are having the best years ever. Well, that's great, even yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. So where would people find you? If people want to just learn about either the LER or – by your book, how, how do people get in touch with you, Greg? Because you've provided yeah. some great value 
on this. Uh, yeah, uh, e easy to find in terms of mind the book, uh, even though we do sell it direct through our simple numbers dot me uh, website. I mean, you, you can get it through Amazon. Uh, and so that, that that's fine as well. In terms of finding me, we actually recently went through a merger back in January. So we're now our firm is now part of Car Rigs and Ingram. Uh, one of the top 20 accounting firms uh, in the U.S. So they they were interested in what we had created in terms of our consulting practice. And so uh, that's been nice. So they can uh, certainly you know, reach out to us through either the simplenumbers.me website or in my case, I would be listed as one of the partners in uh, Car Riggs and Ingram at CRICPA.com. Uh, okay, cool. Cool. Well, thank you very much again, Greg. I really appreciate your time. Dave Anderson, again, thank you for joining my call. Dave's also came out with a book here recently. So thank you all of this again. This is uh, Robert Clinkerbeard, Dave Anderson with the uh, Commercial Landscapers podcast. Appreciate your time today and uh, thanks very much again, Greg. Cheers. Right, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Good seeing you. This was the Commercial Landscaper podcast hosted by Dave Anderson, author of Leader is Not a Title, and Robert Clinkenbeard, author of The Ironman Mindset for Entrepreneurs. You can find more details about the show and the hosts at the Radix Group LLC.com or the commerciallandscaper.com.